Well, thank you for that. Okay, let me move forward then. So the sentient world of fish is, we generally think of fishes in one of two contexts, either as a source of food or a source of recreation, frankly. And today I want to invite you to see fishes through a different lens. First thing I want to try and impress upon you about what we call fishes is that there are two major groups and that they are also very diverse, a very successful and diverse group of animals. Uh, over 33,000 known species and probably a few thousand more based on new discovery rates happening every year. Uh, just a, just a, a comment, um, it's that time of day when the light may change a bit. If it happens enough, I will try to change the lighting in, in this room uh, if it gets too dark at some point. Um, so I mentioned there's, there's two groups of what we loosely and co collectively call fish or fishes. And I just want to point out the two groups. One is the bony fishes or teleosts, of which all but two are members of that group here. But in the upper left, you'll see the white shark and the electric ray. Those are two members of the chondrichthians or the cartilaginous fishes. Now, they're as different from the bony fishes as, as birds are from mammals, but for convenience, we just loosely call them, call them fishes because they've all evolved in the water and they're streamlined and they have fins and that sort of thing. Uh, another superlative is how small fishes can be. This is this was used to be the smallest known vertebrate. There's actually another fish species that has been since discovered that's, I think, possibly less than half the size of this one. From this one is from some uh, freshwater Philippine lakes, and um, you can put three you can put three hundred. Well, I'll just say they three hundred adults weigh less than a, an American penny, so they are truly tiny. Uh, one other superlative, there's many I could share, but time doesn't permit me to share too many today. Uh, but one other I, I like to mention, because I think it's quite a remarkable discovery, and that is the discovery of the, of the greatest longevity of, so far known in a vertebrate animal. And that goes to the Greenland shark here, based on studies of eye tissue from uh, fishes who, sharks who were unfortunately caught in, in deep sea fishing nets or fishing nets up in the Arctic where these sharks live. You can count the corneal layers on the eye in the same manner as you can count rings on a tree. These layers are laid down in a yearly basis. And one female in that study had 392 corneal layers on her eye. So she was approaching her 400th birthday when she was captured, uh, apparently still healthy in a fishing net. But consider that Shakespeare was still writing plays that long ago when this shark was already alive. So onto a topic that we don't generally get much information on, fish minds. I mean, do fish even have minds? Many people think that fishes don't have much going on between the eyes, but in fact, it turns out they have a great deal going on. And I wanna just present to you some highlights now. Tool use, uh, as you probably know, is something that was not that long ago considered to be the unique province of humans. We now know, of course, many animals use tools, uh, but few people know that fishes are among them. This tusk fish here, for instance, has used water as a tool to blow sand away and uncover the, 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 this clam underneath and then has carried the clam to probably a predetermined, pre-known favorite piece of rock or coral. And then with a series of well-timed, well-coordinated head releases and head flicks and releases, is able to smash open the unfortunate clam against the rock, uh, exposing the soft tissues, edible tissues within. Note also that by, bystanders, or maybe by swimmers is a better term, on the left of the picture here, fishes are very alert, aware to what's going on around them. These ones on the left are looking for an opportunity to get some of the spoils. We often also tend to deride fishes of having poor, as having poor memories. And this particular four inch fish of the Australian, oh, sorry, the Atlantic coastline called the frill finned goby has a particularly remarkable memory skill. These fishes live in the intertidal zone. So they live in these tide pools and it's been observed over the, over the course of time that they will and can leap accurately into neighboring tide pools and actually work their way out to open water if they feel threatened by an octopus or a heron or some other predator, for instance, uh, which raises the question, how do they know which way to jump and how far? How do they avoid making a leap of faith and ended up strand, ending up stranded on the rocks? Turns out they do that by memorizing the tide zone, tide pool zone at high tide. So when the water comes in over this area, the little fish swims around among the nooks and crannies and makes a, what's called a mental map, a memory of that whole topography. They can learn it in one day. Captive studies have shown that they can learn, learn a complex topography in one day, and then they can remember it 
uh, 40, 40, 40 days later without any, any inter intervening experience during the meantime. So it's a great memory skill that allows them to uh, relatively safely uh, escape predators by jumping into neighboring tide pools. Another type of tool use goes to, is, is shown by the, the six species of archer fish. They're, na they're named for their ability to squirt water accurately at insects, either perched as we see here near the water or over the water uh, or flying by. And if the insect's flying, you can imagine it takes quite a lot of ballistic skill and they actually use two different techniques. If the insect is flying over the water within about seven inches, they will actually turn and shoot, rotating their body and shooting directly at the target. If the target is, is further away, maybe 10 or 12 inches, they will shoot like a, more like a soccer player or a football player, they will aim ahead to intercept with so the bowls of water is intended to intercept the flying insect. And studies, careful captive studies show that, that archer fishes can hone their skills and actually learn from scratch by simply observe, observing experienced others. They're not born with this skill, they have to learn it. And individuals who've never practiced it themselves but have had the opportunity to watch hundreds of other examples from fellow archer fish doing this successfully, when, they, when they're given a chance, they're able to do it better than, they, they, than other individuals who haven't had the benefit of watching others. So this is called observational learning. and It's considered a pretty high level cognitive skill. And because archer fishes squirt water into the air, what a great subject for testing them on things like, do they recognize human faces? Because you can present a touchpad, a computer touchpad, as you see on the panel C on the right of the slide, a touchpad, uh, and then you can present different visual stimuli and see how they respond. And, and indeed, these archer fishes have kind of proven what aquarium fish owners have claimed for, for decades, and that is they recognize me. They know it's not, not uh, Sam in the, other, in the other end of the room, but it's me, uh, Janice, or whoever right here. They maybe don't know us by name, but they do recognize us by faces. The archer fish could recognize a, a, a familiar face among 40 unfamiliar ones. And they're trained to squirt at a familiar face in, in return for food re reward. And even if you remove the hair as, as on the left here or in the middle panel, the ears as well, um, this, these fishes are able to determine the differences. I, ha I have to say these faces look pretty similar to me, uh, but they're, it just shows their acute visual skills and their ability to remember a familiar face, but not so well when the face is presented upside down. This rice fish on the right, you can see, has been flipped upside down by human manipulation of images. And so uh, this is called the face inversion effect, where, where a fish may have difficulty recognizing another fish, a familiar, an, an otherwise familiar fish who's, who's, who's upside down. We have the same thing. We, we're not very good at recognizing upside down faces. Chimpanzees are very good at recognizing upside down faces. And that probably relates somewhat to their natural biology. They get more practice than we do. Animals tend to be good at what's meaningful to them or what they've had practice at doing. What if we present a fish or fishes with an optical illusion? This is the well-known Ebbinghaus illusion wherein the two orange dots are the same size, but because of the arrangement of blue dots around them, the one on the right in this case looks larger than the one on the left. It's a pretty powerful illusion. You can train a fish, a split fin red tail is one example, uh, bamboo sharks, I think have been tested on this or a similar type of illusion. And you can, you can present them and train them to, to poke their nose against the larger two circles for, in exchange for a food reward. And then if you were present them, to present them with this particular image here, they would swim up to the one on the right. They would fall for the illusion in the same way that we do. Um, I think that has profound, profound implications for the mind of a fish. It shows that they're not robotic. A, a robot would have, would have no difficulty in knowing that they're the same size. It would, it would just make a sort of a, a, an objective calculation. Uh, but a fish is, is not a robot. A fish is a biological entity, a product of evolution with a mind and a fallible mind and with beliefs, apparently. They believe that they just, their circle on the right is bigger than the one on the left. And that strikes me as rather human of them. One of the most stringent tests of cognitive sophistication is the so-called mirror self-recognition test where you present an animal uh, with a, a mirror image of itself or with a mirror and you see how the animal responds. If the animal flees or does a threat display or goes behind the mirror to see who's there, it suggests they don't recognize that it's themselves in the mirror. But uh, at least one species of fish or so far one, because this is very new science, but there was a, a paper published just four, three months ago on showing 
quite definitively that the blue striped cleaner wrasse that we see here, and this is one individual looking at him or herself in a reflection in a mirror, that these, these fishes respond to their reflection in such a way as to indicate that they're, they're seeing it as themselves. For instance, if the scientists put a, a colored gel dot on the, on the chin of the fish in, in a location that the fish cannot see on him or herself, and then give them the mirror and they see it in the mirror they they would most of the fishes would swim to the bottom and try and rub it off or they would change their posture so they could see it better this sort of thing um, if you present them with a with a gel dot that's plain that's um translucent so they can't actually see it even though it's there uh, they won't do that so that rules out the possibility that they could simply feel it there these are the kinds of carefully designed tests that scientists do and publish in peer-reviewed journals so the um Blue striped, cleaner, blue striped cleaner wrasse is the latest addition to a, a small but growing list of, of animals who have passed these mirror self recognition tests. It used to be just elephants, primate, uh, chimpanzees, great apes, and uh, dolphins and, and whales. But now we have also we also have magpies. And yes, I must tell you, there's a one at least one kind of ant has been tested on this test and has passed it as well so it does raise some questions about what's going on here what's the experience of these creatures some a general thing i'm finding is that animals are just in general much more able to do much more than we used to think they were we were really notorious for underestimating them what about how fishes interact the fish society and, and fishes do live among each other including different species and i find inter interspecies so-called interspecies interactions particularly telling as to what might be going on in the mind of a fish. Here we see two quite large reef predators, or one of many species of grouper on the top. And the, this one on the bottom is a, you might recognize as a moray eel, this is a green moray eel. And groupers will actually invite particular known moray eel individuals to go hunting with them on the reef. Why would the grouper do that? Well, it turns out if they hunt together, if they collaborate, they have a, a very much higher success rate at catching food. Each gets more catches than if they hunt alone. And it's pretty easy to figure out why, because they both hunt, have different uh, ways of going into the reef niche. If a, if a fish flees a grouper into the matrix of the, of the reef, you know, the eel might be able to squeeze in the narrow hole and go after that fish. And if that fish is able to escape the eel, well, you know who's waiting out in the open water, this big fast grouper. And follow-up tests after these observations had been kind of confirmed in the wild, follow-up tests uh, in uh, at the University of Cambridge with fake moray eels that were laminated between plastic and could be manipulated with, with wire pulleys, as we see here, showed that a, a grouper who, who would, would prefer to work with a cooperative, a so-called cooperative, more eel from the day before than one who just went back into their into their burrow. So you know, that again, sort of using a bit of a deception here, showing that these animals are recognizing each other as individuals and will make will make sort of logical choices based on the information they had yesterday. Perhaps the best studied interspecies interaction of, of any fish, definitely of any fish, and probably possibly one of the most studied among all, all vertebrate animals is the so-called cleaner client mutualism. It's a symbiosis on, uh, again on reefs. And uh, it's a situation where it's a trade, trading of goods, of uh, valuables. So the puffer fish here, who's not the typical puffer fish pose, most of the time in their lives, they're not puffed out with their spines sticking out as we see in Asian restaurants or what have you. Uh, they're usually more relaxed and their spines are, are flat against their body. This puffer fish is negative, nevertheless a, a predatory fish and could easily eat one of these pair of, of team, team planes, blue striped cleaner asses. But instead the puffer fish is opening the mouth and the gill covers and these fishes are swimming in and out with impunity. Uh, what's going on here? Well, the cleaners are removing parasites. There's a lot of types of sea lice and, and other undesirable little creatures that get into the gills and in the mouth of these animals. They also may be on the skin and the, and the cleaner fishes spend several minutes working as a team doing a pretty thorough job of removing these parasites and bits of algae and sloughing skin and, and what have you. And the puffer, the puffer is one of well over a hundred known clients, so-called client fishes who will line up to wait their turn to get this service. They seem to really like it, which is not to say that it, it, it doesn't get Mach Machiavellian. It actually does. Sometimes the cleaner wrasses won't do such a good job. 
Uh, they may even mucus nip, which is taking a little moat of, of slimy layer out off the outside of the client. It turns out that's quite nutritious and they, they quite enjoy that. Needless to say, the client fish does not enjoy that and will typically jolt, which probably sends a message to any other fishes waiting in the queue that they might want to go somewhere else because these, these guys are not doing a good job today. In turn, cleaner wrasses who may suspect that their clients are not happy will mollify them by fluttering their pectoral fins and, and giving them a little, a little delicate skin massage uh, during a break from parasite removal. So that, that may actually make the client more prone to coming back because after all these cleaner fishes make a living by doing this. They get food in exchange for the client getting a, a parasite removal service and a spa treatment thrown in for good measure. Uh, those are just some of the nuances and dynamics of this relationship. There are many others, but again, time compels me to move on. This curious structure, if you watch BBC documentaries, you may have seen it. It's about a six foot wide, beautiful, round Mandela-like structure um, on the bottom of the ocean, about 80 feet deep off the south coast of Japan, which seems to be the only place where, where this mysterious creature that makes this, a little uh, white spotted pufferfish, another pufferfish species, new, newly discovered to science in the last 10 or 15 years. The male of which spends hours and days creating and maintaining this beautiful circle, which acts as a, as a mating bed and a nest, nest, nest placement um, structure. And uh, the females, really drive the evolution of this kind of so-called sexually selected trait. Males who are good at doing this will impress females. It sends a message that, look, I can not only survive and meet my needs every day, but I can also have enough energy to left over to create this beautiful structure. Aren't I great? I mean, that's anthropomorphizing it a bit, perhaps. But essentially what's going on here is the male is, this is a fish equivalent of the peacock's tail. And the male, uh, if the female is duly impressed, she'll mate and his genes for being a good designer will be passed on into the next generation, assuming some of those eggs will survive. So um, evolution of artistry and aesthetic appreciation in a fish, I would say. What about the evolution of virtue? Is it possible that some fishes actually show virtue? What one manifestation of virtue would be a delayed gratification where an individual deliberately withholds something that they'd like to have and waits for it in exchange for helping another, or not necessarily an exchange, but in this case, there is an exchange. So let me explain what's going on here. Here you see four different species of rabbit fish. This is a, a reef dwelling fish. Of, of a number of varieties and they feed on algae. And it's a bit dangerous to feed on algae because your head's down, you can't see danger coming. Uh, it wouldn't it be nice if you had a lookout, somebody keeping an eye on, on the action above you, which is exactly what we see here. We see one of the two individuals in each case, face up, looking out over the reef, keeping an eye on things, making sure there's no grouper or, or moray eel or heaven forbid a pair of them uh, swimming nearby. And if that happens, they sound the alarm or they, they make some quick movement and the, both of them flee into the reef and hopefully escape more safely. So by doing this, of course, they change places after every couple of minutes and it's a, it's a way for them both to eat safely, much more safely than if they fed it alone. But because the, the lookout is delaying food intake him or herself, that is delayed gratification, which is a form of virtue. You probably heard the term, I know you will have, feeding frenzy among sharks. We love to say feeding frenzy. It's, it's not only alliterative, it it's sort it's of fits our, our model of what we think of sharks as being, which is, which is uh, you know, ravenous, always hungry and greedy and taking what they can get. And don't, don't get in my way, you'll, you'll be trouble. That's the sort of image that we're often presented with of sharks. In fact, uh, it's not like that at all. They're very considerate animals. Very so uh, Many species are very social. This is a situation where fishermen or, or film cameramen dropped some chum, some fish guts in the water uh, near these sharks. I don't remember, I think they might be gray reef sharks. It, it doesn't really matter. The sharks gathered and before long, they're moving around quite quickly, grabbing pieces of food. And in this case, this particular uh, situation here, the one on the right, the lower right, has just grabbed a piece of food in her or his mouth. And the one on the left got there a little bit late. The one on the left is not trying to bite her fellow shark. In fact, I uh, you know, almost looks surprised to be in that situation. But what happened right after this was that shark on the left quickly turned her head to the side and avoided doing, delivering a nasty bite to the one below. So fishing friendly, fishing frenzy isn't very friendly to sharks. I'm not sure it's really the, the right term we should use. The fish 
even have emotions. Uh, emotions are not new. They're not new among animals. They're very useful things to have, and they're probably quite old. Um, it's it's better if you have a system where you 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 recognize, for instance, danger, the, the emotion of fear. If you recognize danger, if you if you thought about it, it's like, hmm, I think that might be a dangerous thing over there. I better flee. You might be food, somebody else's dinner, sooner than if you don't have to think about it. You just immediately flee. That's sort of one. Uh, perhaps a bit simplistic explanation for why, why emotions are, are very old and they've been around for a long time, probably as long as consciousness has been around. So a couple of examples that I think, think speak to fish's inner lives, their inner feelings, their emotions. In one study done and from by researchers at the University of Lisbon, they took about 30 of these striated surgeon fishes into captivity from the Great Barrier Reef and then stressed them even more. They were already stressed from being caught. They stressed them further by putting them in a in a bucket of half of a, barely enough water to cover their bodies for about 30 minutes. Not a very nice thing to happen to a fish. Let me just turn some of the light on and see if this is a little bit better. Okay. And uh, it, you can measure stress in a fish by taking this, they took a small blood sample from the tail vein. And if it has high cortisol, which is a stress hormone, it indicates the animal is agitated and quite, quite unhappy and upset and stressed. And they did that in each case. And these fishes were very stressed when they were then put into the treatment situation, which is that each fish was put into one of two tanks alone. In the top experimental tank, the, there was a, in both tanks, there was a very realistic model of a blue striped cleaner rest, that fish that will sometimes will do the cleaning, but also sometimes do the little caress. And in the top one, you can see the model fish was attached to a motor that allowed it, the model to sweep, uh, move back and forth in a sweeping motion. In the bottom treatment, it was the control, no such movement from the model cleaner fish, it just stayed still. So that what they're looking to see here, they're asking, the question they're asking is, will a stressed fish seek stress relief from getting a pet, getting a, a stroke. There is some evidence that I may come to shortly. I don't remember if it's in my, included in this talk. Suffice to say there's evidence that fishes do like a caress. And uh, lo and behold, in this study, the ones, the stress surgeon fish in the top condition visited that mobile cleaner wrasse at an average of 15 times an hour and got caressed and their stress levels came down quite rapidly. And the one in the bottom treatment, the ones, the 15 and odd or 16 odd individual stressed surgeon fishes who were in that situation, they ignored the, the cleaner wrasse because it wasn't moving, it wasn't able to deliver strokes. They visited it an average of zero times per hour. So a quite you know, highly statistically significant difference. I'm happy to say that all those stressed surgeon fishes were released back into the Great Barrier Reef in the same locations they were caught. That's important because fishes do have culture, they have particular neighborhoods, uh, other fish who they know. You can't just put them in willy nilly, that's not likely to help them, but if you put them, it's important to put them back in their own neighborhood. And as I, as I hinted at, yeah, yes, we can observe this, this interaction between humans and, and fishes where uh, Nassau groupers are a good example. You want this fish here on the right who, uh, it's a wild individual, but probably and may know this particular diver who's told me that she's stroked, uh, these, she's petted these fishes before, and they will swim up and, and be, be petted. I spoke to a vet school a couple of years ago, and one of the students said, yeah, we, we see that in, when my dad and, go, and I go snorkeling in the Cayman Islands every year, and she sent me photographs of that. So it's not a one-off. This is a phenomenon that's observed multiple times in different species. To wit, we have a gray reef shark here in the middle, of course. Uh, resting her head on the lap of Christina Zanato, who is a dive instructor, uh, I think in the Caymans or somewhere near there, and she takes divers down to, um, to pet sharks. They, they play it safe, so they wear chain, chain mail, uh, but these sharks know Christina as individuals. She has names for many of them, and they know she's going to pet them and make them feel nice. Uh, there's no food involved here, um, but there may be hooks involved. And here's a blue shark who has a big fisherman hook buried in the mouth. This is not an uncommon sight, unfortunately. Uh, fishermen catch a shark and don't want to deal with the business end of the shark, so they cut the line and the shark swims around with one or sometimes more, more hooks uh, buried in the mouth, probably painful and affects their ability to feed. This particular blue shark swam among these divers for a number of minutes and they come prepared, the divers, to do this. Christina Zanato does it, but some others do as well. They have bolt cutters and other tools 
to literally cut and remove these hooks from the mouths of the sharks. And sometimes the sharks tarry a little bit afterwards and it suggests that they may actually be aware that these divers have help, helped them and they may even be aware beforehand. We shouldn't sell sharks short. We have lots of examples of whales seeming to, and, and actually giant mantis, which are relatively close relatives of sharks, swimming up to divers uh, with fishing nets and other things on them. They seem to know that these individuals, these divers, these humans might be able to help them. Can a fish be bored? Is that an emotion that a fish might have? Well, individual cichlid male fishes were kept in ta individual tanks in one study. They weren't studying boredom when they weren't studying play, but they saw both, what well, looked like both. The boredom wasn't so much focused on by the researchers who published the study, but play behavior was. And the way these individual male fishes interacted with a semi-buoyant thermometer in their tanks fit the criteria, the formal criteria that scientists have for play behavior. All right, I'm gonna finish up with a little bit of uh, some thoughts and some provocations about the very troubled uh, relationship between fishes and humans. It is a troubled relationship because we exploit and harm fishes in astronomical numbers. I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, I like this photo because it, it, it prompts me to speak to some of the characteristics as to why fishes have kind of been in the cellar of our level of respect and admiration for other other complex vertebrate creatures. One is they, perhaps the biggest one, is that they've evolved in a relatively um, alien environment to us. They've evolved in water. We don't breathe in water, so we, we we're out on dry land and we can't relate to them very much because they have those staring eyes, which don't need to be blinking because they're constantly bathed in water. And they don't seem to make any noises. And yet they make many noises, many species like grunts, um, sea robins are named for the sounds they make underwater, but the sounds they make evolve to propagate below the surface, uh, literally and metaphorically of where our senses are. So we don't hear them and we, we, those things, perhaps they blunt and dull our ability to relate to them. And because we treat fishes pretty miserably as a whole, we've seen a, a pretty dramatic and disturbing decline in their numbers in the last half century. And fishes are faced with a number of existential problems, some of which are also facing us, one main one being climate change, uh, somewhat related to or contributed to by air pollution and water pollution. Um, these things are also related to the rise in acidic acidity level, ocean acidification around the world, which is also disruptive to natural animal populations, including coral reefs, you probably heard of the term coral bleaching, where corals cast off the algae that live uh, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a symbiotic relationship with them. And if this continues uh, because of the heating of the water and other changes in water chemistry, as you can imagine, it, it, those corals will die after a while. There's a, there's a very serious worldwide problem with coral bleaching going on. Ocean plastics, ocean pollution, it was estimated by World Animal Protection about 10, in a study done about 10 years ago, that humans either lose or discard about 640,000 tons of fishing gear every year around the world. Uh, 640,000 tons, as you can imagine, that's no small number. And then, and tragically, these nets continue to wreak havoc after they're lost or discarded by fishing, fishing boats in the commercial fishing trade. Another related issue of ocean plastics or, or plastic pollution is the microplastics, exfoliators and, and tiny little beads that are a product of plastics production that, that number in the quintillions now in some waterways. And little baby fish, they think that they're eggs and they eat them and of course they cannot assimilate them, cannot digest them, and that can be lethal to them. The biggest impact we have on fishes, of course, is the direct impact we have from catching them to eat them or feed them to other fishes in aquaculture operations or pet food or what have you. Uh, nobody knows the number because we weigh, we measure them by weight, hundreds of millions of tons, or 100 million tons, uh, more than that a year. And uh, but, it, but by extrapolating from those figures, it's been estimated that it's minimum 10 uh, hundreds of billions a year of individuals and possibly well over a trillion. So the numbers are, again, astronomical, really hard to kind of fathom. Fishing is also terribly wasteful. Um, a fishing net such as here, this is a close up of a shrimping vessel of all things from, from the Mozambique coastline. 
And you have to look pretty hard at this picture to find any shrimp in there. There are a few, but there's far more non-target species, which are called by the industry as bycatch, un unwanted uh, species, which are usually thrown back into the ocean dead or dying. Uh, these animals don't survive these nets that get crushed, uh, unfortunately. And uh, so it's a pretty wasteful thing. And it's estimated that we produce about 10, sorry, 2 million pounds of bycatch daily worldwide. You've no doubt heard of aquaculture, the, it's basically the factory farming of fishes in, in captive settings, either in sea nets on coastlines, which are a very serious problem for water pollution, uh, or in inland, uh, inland facilities. Uh, there's a number of problems with this. The fishes in there have no control over, over when they get fed, what kind of water conditions they live in, who they socialize with, uh, needless to say. They can't migrate. They also suffer a range of stresses, overcrowding, competition for food, um, parasites, pe pesticides that are applied to them to try and get rid of the parasites. Um, it's, very, it's a very stressful and difficult uh, existence for these fishes. Um, as, as well, one illustration of that is a phenomenon called dropouts uh, in fish farming and salmon farming in particular. And a research team from Norway documented a, um, this dropout phenomenon where some 30% or more is an acceptable loss in, in that industry. 30% uh, of the individuals being dropouts where they become stressed, they can't tolerate the day-to-day, hour-to-hour conditions, and they, they stop feeding and give up. The one on the bottom here is the same age as the one on the top, but the one on the bottom is called a dropout, who will eventually float to the surface and die. And you can measure the cortisol levels, the stress levels are, are very high in these individuals. Almost all of the animals humans kill are to be eaten, which brings me to what I like to often characterize as perhaps the most dangerous weapon in the world. If you're watching the news from, from the Ukraine these days, you might think otherwise, but really uh, what we eat is, is such a huge factor in our global security, um, the, the climate, the environment, went the wrong way. Just, just as an indicator that this is figures that were presented in the Guardian newspaper quite recently, uh, animal agriculture, as opposed to plant-based agriculture, uh, uses up about well over 80% of all agricultural land, and yet it only produces about 18% of the calories we consume. It's just simply far less efficient to eat fish or, or cows or pigs or chickens than it is to eat the plants that they would otherwise eat to build their own bodies. And I found this to be a shocking statistic. This is from a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a very venerable and respected you know, publication. It's estimated now that humans collectively make up about 36% of all vertebrate animals, terrestrial vertebrates. So this is not including fish. I don't know what the numbers would look like if we included fish. Uh, livestock, 60%. And that leaves 4% left for wild animals around the world. So giraffes, lions, um, frogs, lizards, the list goes on, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals, totally in the wild, they make up only 4%. I find that really shocking. That really speaks to that term you may have heard, the Anthropocene. We're, we're not in the Miocene or the Eocene or the Oligocene, we're in the Anthropocene, the human era, where humans are the dominant shaper of the ecology of the planet. And you may have or may not have heard this, but uh, estimates are that the entire Transportation industry world globally produces less greenhouse gases than does animal agriculture. By this time, you're probably thinking this guy probably doesn't eat animals, and, and yes, indeed, that's the case. So this is this is my my biggest provocation slide of the day. Um, you know, if if you if you if you're eating animals still, I encourage you to stop eating animals and go vegetarian. And if you're if you don't want to do that, go once or twice a, a day, a week. It, it's all to the good. And if you haven't tried being plant-based or vegan as it's more often called, um, I recommend that. It's a great step and, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can make, you can make weeny beeny steps, but uh, it because of the previous slides I've just shown you, I'm just not gonna shrink away from this issue. We have to confront the fact that what we eat, what we put in our mouths is a huge factor in the stability of the, plant, of the, of the, of the planet we live on and its ecosystems. And of course, we all do have a choice in what we eat. We can make, we can make in particular in our societies where we, we are the haves, we have lots of choices. 
and go down to the supermarket. You can't get you can't get fish from Finless Foods yet because they're a relatively new company, but they're one of many companies, including Wild Type and Blue Nalu, Blue Nalu that are that are producing and developing with literally tens, sometimes hundreds of million dollars of investment money already. They're developing actual fish meat. They're developing actually tuna in this company, but it, there was never a fish gaffed and hauled into a boat and suffocating on a boat deck. It was, a, it was a, all done in a lab. So the technology of food production is changing radically. There's some real game, game changing things happening. So if you're feeling a bit reluctant to go plant-based, um, you may not have long to wait and you shouldn't encourage this, but you know, there, there is, there's new talk technologies and food options coming down the pipe, pike, no pun intended, all the time. There's some already there. If you haven't tried this product, it's probably in your local supermarket. Give it a whirl. It is not a health food. It's greasy and it's stunningly delicious. So I encourage you to try that. And uh, there was one other slide and I must somehow it got removed from my thing, my presentation. I was just gonna say that uh, just karma, the, the notion of karma is what goes around comes around. And I think if we're, if we're more compassionate towards animals, uh, fish is included, then we're going to be a more compassionate society. And I think the Society of Friends recognizes that, uh, a more compassionate society towards everybody, including, of course, each other. I don't know about you, but I find what Vladimir Putin has done recently is just so arcane. It's like a throwback. It's like we have another, I mean, this is provocative as well, um, but you know, it's like having another Stalin, another uh, Hitler or pick your, Pick your demonic world leader, but but we're in the 20, 2022 now. It just seems to me that that has no place in a modern world, and, and I, I guess I'm, I'm hoping that the sanctions will certainly help the situation. But it just shows that um, it takes a long time to change human behavior, but cultural change happens a lot faster than biological and geological change. So uh, I'm I'm encouraged by what a lot of the patterns I've seen, and I'm hoping that we'll get our act together and we'll live on a more peaceful planet very soon. I think I've said enough time for you guys to ask some questions of me, if you'd like, I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, that was just an amazing whirlwind, but very effective presentation, really love that. And um, I would invite anyone with questions to at least start by putting them in the chat. Um, I, I'm sure everyone, or at least I am quite curious about how you yourself personally kind of got to this point and how how what you've learned about fish has affected you. Yeah, well, cur curiously, a lot of that started with my first trip to the Quaker camp, Camp Nikonis uh, in Midland that I mentioned at the beginning when I was eight years old. And my, my book, What a Fish Knows, starts out with that personal account of being taken to the uh, out onto the bay one of the first evenings I was there by the very nice man Sterling Nelson who ran the camp brilliantly for decades and, uh, and I felt lots of conflict in what I observed with the, with the the violence of the fish it was a beautiful environment on this glassy water but when I when we caught a fish and my little primitive sapling uh, hook and line was very effective I caught a lot of fish but I didn't have to do any of the dirty work Mr. Nelson baited the hooks and pulled them out of the fish's faces and either threw the little ones back or, or put a knife in their head and put them in a basket over the side. I was always an animal lover from my earliest memory. So maybe it was relatively easy for me to, to recognize what I, what I felt was uh, not something not right. So I never, I didn't have a very long career with fishing once I was old enough to reflect morally on things. It just wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah, I think. Quite a few of us have had that experience. <laughs> I think so, which is why I wrote this children's book, Jake and Ava, A Boy and a Fish, because I wanted to, I was hoping to, or I am hoping to validate those mixed feelings uh, and sometimes sad feelings that kids get when they see an animal in a situation that if they have empathy, they recognize that that's not nice because they know that if we were hooked through the mouth and hoisted up by our weight, we would not be very unhappy. And uh, if we couldn't breathe at the same time, we'd be less happy and still. And, and you know, I think young people recognize suffering like older people do. So yes, I do want to tap into that experience in the children's book. Uh, I think I would say that validation is, is very important because we don't get a lot of validation for those emotions that we have. Um, uh, before we go to the chat, I just want to mention that 
the working group on Re relationship with animals has a um, web page on, on the BYM website, and I'm going to put the uh, the URL in the chat in case someone's interested. But we have um, all sorts of videos up there, <laughs> including from our speakers, as well as a variety of humorous videos and other information about what we've been doing. And if anyone was interested in joining our very, very tiny group, we'd be very welcome to have you. And uh, the Unity with Nature has a website too, and I'll let them put in their um, URL also if they'd like to do that, because I know they um, welcome people to attend their meetings, and I'm sure would be interested in people who'd like to join as well. But um, right now, let's start with the chat. Uh, the first question was, what is a good substitute for fish oil in our diets? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I have it in my fridge just a few feet away. If someone really wants me to, I can go and get it. But it's, I forget the name of the manufacturer. I'm living in Canada, so it may be a Canadian product. But uh, it's a company that makes omega-3 omega oils. Um, flax seeds are a very good source of them. I believe walnuts are as well. I'm not a nutritionist, but I've read, I've read the list a few times, but certainly flax and, and, uh, and walnuts are, you know, salmon and some fish are renowned for it as well. Uh, with flax and, and, and walnuts and some of those other plant-based sources, you don't get all the other things, the, the pesticides, which are often concentrated in fish tissue. Um, and also you don't get all the baggage that comes from factory farming and catching, commercially catching salmon at sea. So I do encourage people to look for plant-based sources of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. They're certainly out there. Mm, that's very interesting. And now I, we have a question. I imagine there are written ethical standards for conducting experiments. Are there? Yes, there are indeed. It's estimated that they, it's thought now quite widely that the zebrafish, a very small, beautiful fish, tropical fish, is the most used vertebrate in research. I just wrote a book about flies, and I can tell you that fruit flies are, are used in far greater numbers. But you know, fruit flies are tiny little flies. Uh, and zebrafish are considerably bigger, and so perhaps not surprisingly, as we use more and more of them, there are there are guidelines um, that are often just that. They're recommendations. They're not you know, nobody's beholden to them, depending on who's funding them. Um, uh, having lived and worked in the U.S., where I think most if you know, the people here are. For many years, I know that uh, some of the ruling governing bodies, uh, regulatory bodies there have, have guidelines, but they're often guidelines and nothing more. Suffice to say, lethal, uh, harmful research is very widespread still, and fishes are often the victims of that. Mm -hmm. So wild salmon versus aquaculture salmon, which is better? Uh, I would say which is less bad. It's a good question though. Um, they both have problems. Uh, often, sometimes people think that uh, at least uh, fish farming takes the pressure off wild fish. Uh, it would seem to be a logical conclusion, but in fact, most of the fishes that humans eat are predatory and salmon are included in that list, tuna for instance, and to feed them in captivity uh, so far, we need to feed them with other fish. So huge numbers of uh, menhaden, uh, sardines, anchovies, small, small so-called feed species like that are ca captured in enormous numbers um, uh, processed into fish oil or what's called fish meal. And that is a major, the main ingredient of most uh, commercial fish foods. I, when I was researching what a fish knows, I went to a, an aquaculture research operation in West Virginia and I learned a bit about the, those, those matters when I was there. So um, I would say what's less bad, I don't know. Uh, you know, at least a wild salmon got to live free before being caught and maybe probably for many years to get to a size, a commercially viable size. Whereas uh, one in aquaculture never sees and never knows freedom in the, in the truest sense. So one could argue based on that, that uh, wild caught is less likable, less dislikable uh, than, than, uh, than farm raised. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm not exactly extolling the virtues of either. Seeing a person petting a fish seems very off-putting and does not respect the personhood of the fish. How do you feel about that? Uh, I'll just interject. It's so interesting because I actually had the opposite reaction. I was thinking everything you presented was so amazing. But the thing that seemed to kind of get me emotionally was the idea of a, of a shark that wanted to be petted. Um, but uh, not to everyone, apparently. So how do you feel well, about I 
Yes, it's a good question. Um, I think the key here is that the fish approach the human, that the fish have some uh, voluntary control over the interaction. And uh, the situations that I described were that. You can watch YouTube videos now of um, a number of situations where somebody is petting a fish in a tank and the fish swims back and gets petted again. It looks like the fish is enjoying it, but in a tank, there's not many places for the fish to go. There's other ones where you can see people picking them up, literally holding them out of the water. The fish clearly trust them and they pet them and they gently toss them back. The fish swims back for another round. You know, out of context, it's not always possible to know the whole of what's going on there. I think it's a positive interaction. I think the fish wants it, but who knows? Maybe that guy's trained that fish to, you have to swim to my hand and I toss you back three times before you get any food. You know, that's just a hypothetical, but it's conceivable there could be some, uh, some nefarious things going on behind the scenes. Most cases though, I think it's, it's the fish is voluntarily swimming up because they do like the petting. It could also be petting for stress relief or petting because they like it. You know, those are a bit different scenarios. And captive, the more captive it is, the more artificial it is and the more possibility there might be for not all of it being great. Mm -hmm. That's my take anyway. I found that I can communicate with trees. I'm thinking that plants are also sentient beings. Well, what will we eat in this case when science catches up with this? It's, it's, it's nice to see, I find, more and more discussion about the, how broad sentience may be applied. And, and I've read a couple of books recently um, about plant, the question of plant sentience. Um, and, and even in these books where there's that, some advocacy for that, for that idea, uh, the, 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 the authors have been kind of careful to say that they're not speaking of sentience in the same kind of way as we think of it as in animal life. And this is about, all about anatomy and physiology and having nervous systems or not. Uh, we, ultimately, we don't know, right? We cannot get in the body of a, of a tree and know for sure. And, and actually that argument is made for other vertebrate animals. Um, but what I think is really important to, to mention in this, in this subject is that hypothetically, let's just say plants were, or turn out to be sentient, that they have feelings. Um, then somewhat paradoxically, that's an argument for a plant-based way of eating for the simple reason that far fewer plants are consumed if they're eaten directly than if we eat animals. The animals we eat, cows, pigs, chickens, in particular goats, had to eat many, many, many plants to make their, their cow flesh or their chicken flesh. Um, so far more plants go into the production of meat than if we ate plants directly. So uh, I think that that fact kind of gets us around the whole question of what are the choices we should make if plants actually are sentient. Oh. Yes. Home aquariums, institutional aquariums, swimming with dolphins, etc., increase love for marine creatures. Your thoughts? Hmm. Maybe. Um, uh, they certainly give us an opportunity to see these animals, although I would, I would ar counter argue that somewhat out of context. Um, but I remember seeing dolphins in an aquarium long before I had any opinions about aquariums, and I was amazed by what I saw. But um, just as, you know, the idea of elephant rides at the zoo and performing dolphins who are doing kind of following their instructions, I think kind of demeans the animal and doesn't really respect the animal uh, as him or herself. And, and I think it's fair to say him or herself. These are individuals with not just biology, but biographies, um, with a life that has meaning um, for them, intrinsic meaning and intrinsic worth. And you give them the choice of doing these things or the choice of freedom. They take freedom every time once they're comfortable with knowing that what freedom means when they, when they, if they, because they may be captive weird, in which case there's no opportunity to viably release them into the wild. So I have, mixed but mostly negative feelings about captive situations for animals some species that have very small home ranges and don't have don't have huge demanding needs in the wild perhaps could have a good quality of life in captivity i've been to aquariums that, that are beautifully operated and, and 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 do have some educational value but at the end of the day i tend to lean against them as in terms of the cost benefit analysis I think we should always weigh the animal's experience into the equation. And most animals prefer freedom to captivity. Oh. Okay. And now we have YouTube and you know, there's so many ways for people to get to see. 
and appreciate animals like that amazing octopus movie that was came out yeah here. yeah really captured the imagination now, octopuses are a great example of that expanding awareness the expanding circle of moral concern that we see with this sentience because I don't know of any scientist who's arguing now against consciousness and awareness and cognition and even emotionality in octopuses. Two generations ago, nobody was even asking the question. No one, nobody even had an opinion on that, barely. And now we see not only opinions, but we see an accumulation of evidence in support that these animals are complex uh, individuals with lives, despite being relatively short-lived octopuses. There are that there are other invertebrates, uh, lobsters that, that can live over a century and appear to live close to a century. Mm. Wow. And yeah. that brings us to another question which came in. What about shellfish? Yeah, what about shellfish? So I'm actually trolling for one of a better word for uh, new topics for my next grown up book. Mm -hmm. And right now, pretty much top of my list is a book on crustaceans. It doesn't sound very exciting. And that, that is a, a major consideration in writing a book, but I don't just, I don't just write books to sell to more people than I can. If I did that, I'd write about dogs and, and um, <laughs> birds because people love them. And butterflies, maybe even flies are not popular. Uh, fish is not as unpopular as flies, but, but they make great subjects. With crustaceans, um, which are kind of part of what we collectively call shellfish, uh, they do meet a number of criteria that I think makes them a good subject for a book, and that is that they're heavily exploited by humans, huge astronomical numbers, considerably larger numbers than the, the fish that I mentioned. And there is really interesting science coming out about their sentience, uh, pain perception, uh, evidence in support, uh, that they will seek pain relieving drugs if they're given the chance, these sorts of hallmarks type studies of, of what appears to be a sentient creature. And the third criterion is that very few of us are aware of those studies. Very few people are aware uh, that these, there is research on crabs and prawns and such that, that supports that they're sentient and that they have sophisticated uh, courtship and mating strategies, for instance, ways of living. It remains to be seen whether I will find enough compelling material to sort of justify a book that I, that I feel I could write that would work, but I'm certainly exploring that. So that's one way to ask, uh, answer the question. Um, you know, a lot of shellfish are also mollusks, uh, clams and such, uh, because they live a, much of their adult life in a sessile state, they're not moving around, it's only as larvae when they're very little that they're mo mobile in the water. Uh, they are perhaps less compellingly sentient because they don't, you can't move away from the painful stimulus if you're sessile, if you're stuck in one place. So that may have led to a lower level of sentience. These are the kinds of things I think we need to think about in weighing the pros and cons of, of our relationships to these different groups of animals. But certainly shellfish collectively is a very interesting topic in, in this day and age when it comes to sentience, cognition, consciousness, and a lot of scientific interest growing there. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> that comes uh, that happens. <laughs> There was a comment about fish oil, just FYI for anyone who wants to look at, um, mentioned that algae derived omega-3 supplements are widely available. Um, so then the next question was, what if animals or plants are directed by the great spirit to present themselves in a certain moment to a hunter as some indigenous cultures believe? Mm. To me, that sounds a little convenient from the hunter's perspective. But, um, uh, you know, I'm not close to the possibility. Um, I think based on the animal behavior that I've studied, the, the, the research I've done, which to be fair, excludes living among native peoples and being an expert in that, in that realm. But based on what I've seen from the animal behavior itself, animals universally um, have fear responses and move away and try to escape threatening situations. I don't know of animals that proverbially or otherwise offer their necks for what with a knife. Uh, they struggle, they, they try with all their might to escape the threat of death. So to me, that says that uh, it makes me skeptical that an animal would sort of present themselves. I'm open to the possibility and I'm, I'm happy to look at some evidence for that, but I haven't seen it yet. Hmm. Okay, I think we're at the end of our questions. I am very grateful to you, Jonathan, for spending this time with us. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone to go into a, a short period of silence.
Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jonathan, for putting this information in front of us. It's very little known, as you said, and um, so. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks for the invitation. It's lovely to meet you, albeit not in person, but thank you for your interest in coming out tonight. Very much interested. Thank you. And there are many thanks coming in in the, in the chat. Thank you for that. I'm reading. Thank you now. very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Take well, care of yourselves. Okay. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you.